Benvenuti a tutti, and welcome to another edition of Italian America Long Island. My name is Dave Anthony Sutta Ducati. Tonight we have a special guest. He has been the immediate past chairman of the Committee on Social Justice for the Order Sons and Daughters of Italy in America for New York State, and he is currently the national consultant on Columbus Affairs for the Order of Sons and Daughters of Italy in America. Will you please welcome Mr. Lou Gallo? Hello, Dave. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate being here, really. Well, Lou, this is a special presentation for us tonight. And what are you going to be doing for us? Well, you will see me in costume, and I will act as Christopher Columbus in the first person. And my function will be to debunk and to dispel all misconceptions about Christopher Columbus that people have been hearing. It's time to, you know, to write the record and to go on, uh, on record by saying that this is not true, it's a total fabrication. Now, Lou, you are an expert in Columbus. How long have you been studying him and where did you get your information from? Okay, I've been doing it for eight years. When I became the New York State Chairman, I, uh, the issue immediately surfaced and I had to, you know, protect the uh, Columbus legacy because it's part of our history and culture. And so I delved into all of this uh, study about Columbus and oh my gosh, I've read works from Carol Delaney, uh, The Quest for Jerusalem, Rafael Ortiz, Columbus the Hero, uh, all other kinds of books that were written. Uh, oh my gosh, it, it just, I have a whole book, a whole box that I use and, and I study. Do you use any primary sources? Yes, uh, within some of this material, it advances you to some primary source material. I've read his log, personally. I've read his will. I've read uh, his letters and his, what is called the Libro Copiador. And uh, you can really get an idea of the essential substance of this man. You're going to be doing this in costume. Tell me a little bit about this costume. Okay, this costume, at first, we, we used to rent it while it allowed me to do these presentations. But then the board decided, instead of that kind of an expenditure, is that we get somebody to actually make it, or make a costume and have it for all time. And so they commissioned the gal from Utah as a seamstress. And she put together this gorgeous costume that the viewing audience will see very shortly. And that's how it became uh, a part and parcel of the program. So Columbus is actually going to come alive. I'm alive. Absolutely. And he's going to be returning to give us the truth. The truth of my legacy. Well, this is a, a quite, quite a wonderful presentation that you do, Lou. Thank you. And I, I was struck the first time I saw it, uh, the, the detail that you know about Columbus's yeah, life. That's the idea. So to make you feel that you really are, that I was really there. And you, you really do get that feeling. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let's watch Columbus Returns with Mr. Lou Gallo. Buongiorno. Cristoforo Colombo da Genova. That's right. Christopher Columbus from Genoa, right before your eyes. I am very disturbed and that's why I'm here today. Because I'm finding out that my statuary all over the world is being vandalized and destroyed. Why? I'm sure, you see, there are attempts to get rid of my holiday on a calendar in schools and municipalities and states. Why? And stigmatize and distort my entire ideology about my mission and who I was. And my legacy, oh, I'm, that's why I'm here. I'm here to dispel all those particular notes. These revisionists and detractors don't pursue in depth the real story. And as a result, it gets distorted. And of course, it stigmatizes my name and it stigmatizes my, my accomplishments. This, of course, cannot happen. Yeah, Christopher, that's the name my mother gave me, Susanna Fontana Rosa. She gave me that name and it's tied up with a legend, the Christ bearer. The great Syrian giant himself, who took people across the Swift Jordan River. And when, at one time, there was the Christ child, and I carried him across, he was so thankful that he called me, instead of Reprobus from Syria, St. Christopher, the Christ bearer, and my name, Colombo. 
The dog, the Christian this dog. This was the gift of Christ to me. That's my name. Wait, Colombo. That's a dove. That's the Christian sign of peace. The dove that bears Christ. That's me. Aha! I am preordained. This is my mission in life to spread the gospel, the one true religion of Jesus Christ. Ah, I must do this. Ah, I've learned that the maritime navigation unlocks the secrets of the world. Oh my gosh, in my name. Aha! I will be maniacal about this. This will be my mission in life. But I did enroll with my brother in a naval academy. Thanks to Prince Henry the Navigator. He set up all these naval academies to learn a lot about maritime navigation. And uh, as a sailor, you know, I was very interested since 10 years old. I was 10 years old, and my brother Bartholomew and I would go down to the General Shore, and we would watch these ships and take in the sea air, and we would just be engulfed by this beauty. And then at 14, okay, I would actually take a little skip down through the bay, and I would actually really enjoy the sailing. And then I got hired as a particular sailor on a few expeditions. But by the time I was 18, I was a full-time sailor. And I had a lot of strength and a lot of physical ability. And I could jump from gunwale to gunwale. I could run up the, up the cords, up to the crow's nest, without too much difficulty. In fact, they marveled at the fact that I could also hoist those sails all by myself, even in a storm. And so as a result of, of this particular involvement, I uh, learned a lot about uh, maritime navigation. And when I did, uh, I noticed certain things about the current. Around the Cape Verde Islands, the current went west. And I thought, hmm, we know there are lands north. We know there are lands south because of the Portuguese rounding the Cape uh, of the Good Horn and also eventually uh, around Africa. And then they landed in India, so we knew there they were points east. Why can't they be land west? Hmm. So I contacted my good friend Paolo Toscanelli, okay? He was a physician and a mathematician, uh, and he said to me, I said to him, um, you come up with some calculations, uh, uh, Paolo, and, and then I pursued Afrigan, a Persian mathematics, uh, mathematician, and then I pursued Claudius Ptolemy, oh, and I used some statistics from Eratosthenes, a Greek mathematician, and we put together this whole uh, calculation, and. Uh, I, we felt that uh, the length of latitude is only 45 degrees. Hmm. I know we were wrong. Eventually, we were proven wrong. Uh, it's really about 59 degrees, and Eratosthenes was the one who was the closest to get there. But it didn't matter to me. I don't care if it was 45 degrees. I don't care if it was 10 degrees. I was going. I was going. The whole ideology was to sail west, to find a route, and meet the great Khan of Cathay. Now, how does he get into the picture? Well, you know, I read the... Of travels of Marco Polo. And in there, it said that the great Khan was interested in Christian theology. He had met Christian missionaries, and he was very, very interested in learning more. And bring me the oils of the Holy Sepulchre, he said. And we decided that we would send Christian missionaries, but the trip was so difficult. So it never happened. So I decided that I would take on that responsibility. So here it is. We're going to sail west. We're going to meet the great Khan of Cathay. Oh, yeah, there's the riches and all of that, the dyes and the perfumes and the tapestries and all that other stuff. Okay, but that's not really the idea of the mission. The idea of the sailing was to gather those riches and use those as a means to finance this expedition to meet the great Khan of Cathay. Using his forces and Christian forces, we would defeat the Muslim Turks and we would free Jerusalem and we could spread the Christian gospel all over the world. That is my mission. And that's what it's really all about. The goal was not an end, it was a means. That was the whole idea. So anyway, I finally convinced uh, Queen Isabella that uh, this is something that we should do, and you know, we were kindred spirits. She also was very uh, Christian. And it was the obligation of every Christian at that time to spread the gospel and to convert people to the one true religion. And that's why I decided to take on this mission. Oh, I became quite maniacal about it. And so we sailed west. I cobbled together a crew. Uh, the Palo sailors were the best. So when we launched on August the 3rd, 1492, we actually sailed from Palo, Spain. And uh, we sailed directly to the Canary Islands. And then from the, uh, we actually picked up some provisions there. And then we sailed west. And then I hear I invaded these new world, this new world. 
Invasion? What is this all about? There was no invasion. What is that definition of an invasion? Forceful entry with hostile intent. I didn't do that. In fact, when I landed in the Bahamas, you know, I claimed that land for Spain, and then all of these lands were now the possession of uh, the sovereigns. They became part of the sovereign uh, kingdom of Castile, and all of the nations could not intervene at all. That was the ideology of the time, by the way. Okay? And so, oh my gosh, the next thing we did was I gave them gifts. I gave them hawk bells, and I gave them little bits of beads and some of our caps and some of our clothing. Uh, and it was truly a discovery. I never saw these people before, naked as the day they were born. And they, too, it was a discovery for them. They never met such Europeans with white skin and beards and all that clothing that we wore and these majestic ships and, oh, my God, the superior weapons we had. They never saw a Lombard cannon. They never saw a crossbow. They had no idea. So it was truly a discovery. And the beauty part about discovery is is to find something that is unknown and make it known. So from the European vantage point, it was truly a discovery. And it was a discovery for them. But thanks to the printing press, all of this information and all this news about my discoveries was spread all over Europe. And that started an entire migration to the West. And the action shifted from the Mediterranean Sea all the way to the Atlantic. And all these people came with their philosophies and their culture and their moral ways and their folk ways and they developed this great, beautiful hemisphere, which, by the way, created the greatest country you live in, the United States of America. My discovery, then, is as valuable not only to Westerners, but also to Latinos, okay, in my discoveries of the, in, in Central America from Honduras all the way to Panama. That's really very important, you see. Okay, so we had this beautiful intermingling. I found these Taino people to be the greatest people I have, that ever lived, that I ever met in my life. They were very, very generous, very hospitable, and very happy-go-lucky, my dear. And I must say, quite promiscuous with their women. I, that was something, it was like giving a gift uh, to, um, you know, a European, and you could use them as they wish. And, and when they did give me some of the women, I immediately stopped it because the men were being very abusive, and that never happened again. Okay, so this thing about sex rings and child rings and all this other stuff is all bunk. That never happened. No, not at all. Okay? Now, we had a problem in the first uh, discovery, uh, well, on the first voyage. On December the 25th, we got into a shipwreck. All right? And up to that time, having met all these natives and having a beautiful cordial relationship, I thought it was very important to meet up with their Taino chief, Kwakanagari. And he was such a very hospitable man. He actually gave me little nuggets of gold. He gave me gold plating. Oh my gosh, I wanted to know more. Because again, like I told you, that gold was purposely used as a means to pay for soldiers and to pay for the trip to go to the Holy Land and meet up with the Great Khan of Cafe. That's really what it was all about. And uh, because of the shipwreck, in the middle of the shipwreck, I had men actually find Guacanagari, and what do you think he did? He did a wonderful thing. He took his native people, and they came out, and they took the shipwreck, and they saved a lot of my timber. They created a fort for us. They took all our belongings, they put it in the hut, and had people guard it. Okay? I was so thankful to Guacanagari, I said, I want to take you on the Nina and give you a feast. And he said, no, no. I want to give you a feast. And that night, we had a feast, and my gosh. He gave me all kinds of gifts and more nuggets, and he gave us a lot of food. And the next thing that happened was I gave him some gifts in between. I gave him a beautiful collar. I gave him a ring. I gave him my red shoes. It was wonderful. And then I had to go back because now I had to rescue these men. I left 39 behind. And the 39 that I left behind, I gave him strict orders. One, do not molest the women. Do not the maraud the villages. Do not leave the island. And if you do, please make sure you let Kwakanagari know that you are leaving the island. Make sure you maintain strong diplomatic relations with Kwakanagari, okay? And of course, you are Spanish people, you want to show that you are cordial and that you are respectful people. Well, when I came back, all 39 were dead. And when I approached Kwakanagari about it, he said, think of the complete opposite. People like Diego de Arana, Rodrigo Escobedo, Pedro Gutierrez, 
They divided up into little predatory gangs. They went around the island. They captured men and made them slaves. They took women as concubines. Each man had about four or five concubines. They was held up into the fort. And they decided to roam the countryside and just create havoc all over the place. But uh, Ganakari could not control it. The men that I left behind had totally lost all kinds of sense. And con consequently, Kayanabo from the kingdom of Magwana, he decided that he was going to end this, and he killed all. Of course, when we came back on the second voyage, the men were revengeful. And I said, no, no don't be revengeful. We'll just move to another place further east, and we'll set up a new town called La Isabella, after the queen. Kayanabo was not finished with us. So you see, I had a terrible, terrible predicament. I am trying to maintain cordial relations with the natives, but yet I had avaricious, ambitious men who were seeking revenge. That was right there, the pivotal point that made the enterprise turn south. Okay? I had nothing to do with that. I wasn't there. So I'm not, you're not, you cannot discredit me because of the savagery and the brutality of those 39 men. I simply wasn't there, and that's usually what happened. And my second voyage, when I came back, again, I was under contract to discover new lands, to find the route, to find the Great Khan. So I had to leave the back the settlement to a commission. It was run by my, the clergy, my men, some of my men, and of course my brothers. They couldn't handle these avaricious, ambitious rogues. Again, they roamed the countryside, capturing women, distorting. Uh, uh, my legacy and who I was, spreading lies that this is what I was, the kind of person I, I am, and I am not. I wasn't there. I simply wasn't there. So when I came back from my discoveries, my brothers would say, you've got a problem. And at this point, Francisco Roldan, who I left as the overseer of a lot of the supervisory work that he had to do, actually was very upset. Okay? And he said, you see, Columbus left you behind. He doesn't care about you. He only does care about himself. You want more sex? You want more glory? You want less work? I'm the man. You come, you come with me. And he did. He commanded the ships. He commanded the men. He went all over Hispaniola. I couldn't believe what he did. He stole the, the grain from the, the, the stores. He took the cattle. He took the tribute. Of course, that was a customary thing that we always did. And uh, then he created a little enclave in the kingdom of Zorago in southwest Hispaniola. And uh, there he rested as like a, the, the, the viceroy of the island. So when I approached him, he didn't want to see me. I sent three envoys on three separate occasions. He refused to see me. So what did I do? I had nothing I could do. He was in command. He finally did show up, and he sent me an ultimatum. And this is what the ultimatum said. One, I want safe passage to any of the men who want to get off this island because there's too much work. The heat, the humidity is terrible. I'm going to send them back, compensate them with a slave. Number two, when I had left, he had actually started to set up plantations called Encomienda. And he had put slaves there to work the land for the Spanish settlement. I didn't mandate that. He did. And he wanted slaves to remain for those who did stay behind. The third thing he said is, I want to be the alcalde for life, meaning the mayor of Zaragua. And the fourth thing, if I don't agree, guess what? We have the right to kick you off the island. So what did I do? I signed it. He was in command. All I asked was, please, be more peaceful with the natives and make sure that the natives can give us food. Because these gentlemen didn't want native food. And we were always shorted with our provisions on those ships, thanks to that Bishop Juan Fonseca, who always shorted us because he wasn't in favor of a mission headed by a foreigner. You see, the Spanish were also very ethnocentric people. God forbid that they're being led by the Genoese and not by the Spanish. And that's the truth. So again, that was a knock against me too as well. Especially because the House of Aragon and the Genoese constantly fought each other. I had more trouble with the Spanish than I do with the natives. Okay? I never asked the natives to do any work. I used to petition the crown and say to them, please send me miners for the gold. Please send me uh, workers for agricultural workers. I never resorted to the enslavement of native people to work those lands. You could thank Francisco Roll down for that. Okay? And then when some of these men left because they just found the whole settlement inhospitable for a lousy, measly wage, uh, the 
Queen sent over Francisco de Bobadilla with strict instructions. Find out what's going on, okay? And come back and report back. But what happened? When he got there, he saw that I had hung seven Spaniards for contravening the mistreatment, for contravening the treatment of the, those local natives. That's right. Because I kept writing to the Queen and telling them, listen, these people are mistreating these natives. You have to do something. Do you know one historian even called me the first civil rights activist in the Western Hemisphere? How about that? Because of my concern for those people. And I did. I was very concerned. And so what happened was Bobadilla, so upset, actually grabbed me, put me in chains, threw me in the bowels of a ship called La Garda, took my brothers and threw them in, in another ship, okay? And I was sailed away back to Castile, supposedly under arrest. What did Bobadilla do? He took my home, he took my belongings, he took all my provisions. He, he freed the prisoners that I was going to hang the following day. He lowered the taxes. He basically ingratiated himself with these men and they loved it. All they did was to create a reign of terror. And again, the same thing, marauding the villages, stealing, uh, capturing women. Where was I? I wasn't there. Basically, all these savages and all of this brutality, I wasn't there. I was on a bounds of ship being shipped back to Castile. You could thank Francisco Bobadilla. Oh yeah, he decided to now uh, question the men and they put together this expose and a story, and he's then some revisionists look at it and say, oh look at that, that's the truth. No, it's not the truth. Historians have proven that was not the truth. These men were covering their own hides and blaming me. Okay? And in my fourth voyage, things even got worse. So in my explorations along Central America, I gave them gifts, they gave me gifts. It was a wonderful time. Of course, we had to contend with some terrible weather and hurricanes and storms. And I was getting sick. I used to come down with the swine flu and uh, malaria. I had problems with gout. It was really a terrible trip, okay? But I had a little trouble in Panama because my men were so starving that we ate so much food that the Indians there wanted to get rid of us. So we did. We hightailed it out of there. And what happened? I wound up on Jamaica, marooned. Well, what did I do? Okay, eventually I said to the men, you're not going aboard, okay? I'm stopping you from engaging with the natives. You're going to create your own huts right on the ship. And those ships were dilapidated. They were so riddled with shipworms, we couldn't even navigate, okay? I sent two canoes out to make contact with Hispaniola. Nicholas Diavando, who at the time was the Viceroy, this is around 1500 or so, and my friend Diego Mendez said, you got to send a ship to rescue him from Jamaica. He didn't do anything for six months. I know why. Because he was committing atrocities there so badly that he knew that I would report him back to the Crown. And guess what he did? He let me stay there for six months. Six months doing nothing. All I could do was try to keep the men quiet, keep them away. The men were getting restless. There was even an assassination conspiracy against me because I refused to get off that island as I was waiting for a ship from uh, Nicholas Diavando. And you know what he did? You know what he did? He just created this great feast for all the natives, assembled 84 chiefs. Then he captured them all, stuck them in a hut, locked up the hut, and burned it to the ground. Took their queen, Anna Kayona, and demanded that she be a concubine for his troops. When she flatly refused, he hung her. Where was I? In Jamaica, marooned for a year and four days. I wasn't even there. And revisionists and detractors blame me for that. It was Nicholas Diavando. It was Rodrigo Escobedo. It was Pedro Gutierrez. It was Francisco Bobadilla. It was Francisco Roldan. And some other beauties. Diego Escobar. He's another one. A mutiny. As soon as he heard mutiny, he was on board. Okay? They didn't like me because I was Genoese and I, and I led this expedition. They wanted a Spaniard there. And Martin Alonso Pinzon trying to steal my glory as the captain on the Pinta, claiming he was discovering lands. And he left us in the first voyage at the end of November. We landed in October. The end of November, he was off on his own. He was gone for six weeks. And then he comes back with a lie. Oh, I was only just looking around. You were looking around for gold. That's what you're looking around for your own self. And you popped up together people who were slaves on your ship. I took them off your ship and I sent them back home. And Guatanagari, who was always running into problems with the Caribs. The Caribs, the hostile people. Formal manhunts, they were cannibals. You get that from the Tainos. They used to call them Canib. 
Kanib, that's how we got the word cannibal. What does Karib mean? Karib means strong men in warfare. What does Taino mean? People of the good. And they were. They lived up their personality, they lived up to their name. This is what was going on. And here, in the midst of all of this chaotic mess, I'm trying to maintain cordial relations, report back to the Queen about some of the resources that are there. Did I mention slavery? I surely did. The Portuguese did when they, were, when they actually went around exploring. But I said to her, you may want to do that. It had nothing to do with I couldn't find gold. The gold was there. Just didn't have enough men or the men came down with sicknesses as a result of the heat, the humidity, and the food shortages. They were always sick. They didn't have enough men to do it. How did I know? Because on the fourth voyage, as I was coming in to Hispaniola, three galleons of ship loaded with gold from Hispaniola were on their way out. And I said to them, do not go, there's a hurricane coming. You know, I could predict hurricanes and storms. That's how good of a navigator I was. They didn't listen to me, they laughed. Who was on that ship? Roldan and Bobadilla and Guarianex, who was another rebel native, in cahoots with these guys. And what happened? It went down. My men were saved because I was smart enough to find the inlets and bays and protect the ships. And my particular ship saved. And what happened? One galleon did survive. It was loaded with provisions that were remanded back to me, had to go back to Spain, demanded by the Queen. And that survived. And everybody said, ooh, he dabbles in the black arms. He's a sorcerer. Nothing to do with it. I told him not to go. They went. Okay? Like I said, I had more trouble with the Spaniards than I did with the natives. I did the best I could to maintain cordial relations with them. And in my will, did you ever read my will? What does my will say? One of the stipulations to create a bank account in the Banco San Giorgio in Genoa to create a hospital and a church in Hispaniola. Purpose? Pray for the, my soul, number one. Number two, convert the Indians to Christianity by the use of the church. And because of the raging sicknesses amongst those Indians, have a hospital to take care of them. Yes, we did contribute measles and influenza and the common cold and smallpox. But guess what? When you meet culture, cultures meet, they also, we got diseases from them. Hepatitis, encephalitis, and tuberculosis. And a skin lesion that they used to come out with called yours. When the spiral cheat or the pathogen entered the European body, we got syphilis. And on my first and second voyages, when we came back, we spread syphilis all over as an epidemic all around. So there's justifiable reasons for what happened. These are not misconceptions, this is the facts. I changed the whole course of Western civilization. All of those people migrated and created this beautiful Western hemisphere and eventually created the United States of America, the land in which you live. And do you think, with all of that kind of accomplishment, I don't deserve a holiday in my name? I don't deserve a statue? Do you know I'm on three continents with those statues before this garbage started? Three continents, North, South America, and Europe, the most, even more than Jesus Christ. That's how honored I was, because I changed that course. I'm not an ogre, okay? I'm not a brutal to uh, totalitarian invader. I'm not a barbarian. I was a devout Christian whose only mission was to try to meet the great Khan and to spread the Christian word. That's really what I was all about. And on March 20, on May 22nd, on May 20th, I'm sorry, 1502, 1506, on May 20th, 1506, I passed. My final words, in manus tuus domine, commendo spiritum meum. The same words Christ uttered on the cross. In your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. And so I passed. And here I am again. Please, don't you think I now deserve a holiday in my name? A statue in my name? Please, now that you know the true facts, do your best to protect and defend my legacy. I would greatly appreciate it. Arrivederci. Lasciatemi cantare con la guitar in mano Lasciatemi contare Lasciatemi cantare perché ne sono fiero, sono l'italiano, l'italiano vero. Buongiorno Italia.
de que nos hizo.